Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, or indeed tomorrow, uh, depending on wherever and whenever you are. Uh, my name is Mal Burns, and welcome to Crossworlds. This is a show where we look at the uh, future of the metaverse, interoperability, and similar matters. My guest today is Justin Clark Casey, who can best be described as the core developer at OpenSim.org. Now, OpenSim uh, will be known to many of you as the the, the main platform um, that um, is used for well, a lot of the metaverse platforms um, other than um, Second Life, where we're filming from. So, um, I'd like to um, get uh, Justin to sort of introduce himself, give us a bit of history, and sort of tell us exactly what OpenSim.org is. So, welcome, Justin. Hello, Mal. Welcome to right. Crossworlds. And um, yeah, far away. Well, thanks very much. It's uh, great to be here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit, uh, bit nasty and start with a, a small correction. It's OpenSimulator.org um, rather than OpenSim.org, which is something else entirely. Um, oh, yeah. By the look of it, <laughs> some, some kind of other framework. But yes, yeah, OpenSimulator.org. So, so what is OpenSim? So OpenSim, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, having said that, I'm still going to call it OpenSim. So uh, there you go, just for extra confusion. So what is OpenSim? OpenSim is uh, kind of an open source project uh, envisaged to help provide the server platform side of 3D virtual environments such as Second Life. So it was started um, about, ooh, um, probably about four and a half years ago now by a guy called um, Darren Gard, um, who kind of like, I think, from the history as I recall it, because I didn't join until um, about nine months later, he kind of, this was shortly after um, Linden Lab had open sourced the client the viewer. So he, uh, he came on the uh, Second Life list and said, hey, I'm, I'm kind of like just constructing this server and it kind of, kind of just works and, you know, who's interested? And so a bunch of people got together and, and started working on it. And, and slowly over time, it's kind of grown and got a little bit better every time and implemented more and more stuff um, until at the point where we are today, where, we, uh, where a, lot of, a lot of grids out there kind of like use Open Simulator to run their own, their own systems. And, and other people, mm. uh, such as people in academia or people even in the military, are kind of like um, experimenting with open simulators as, the, as a kind of open source way to provide a general virtual environment platform. Um, so I can say a bit about myself briefly. I used to work for IBM um, about three and a half years ago. And I kind of like, I kinda like just, um, just realized, because I was doing a master's, I just realized I didn't actually want to be an academic. It's kind of like too much, too much paper writing and more, not enough coding. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was kind of like looking around for something else to do. And I thought, well, OK, why don't I just do the coolest thing I could possibly do? Um, and that happened to be kind of virtual worlds. And, open, and IBM at the time had, uh, had an had a involvement in Open Simulator. They actually had a uh, developer kind of like coding on it. And he was having these internal meetings within IBM, uh, a guy called Sean Daig. And I kind of went along and kind of got involved. And, you know, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a programmer, that's naturally what I do. And started writing code and, and soon got into the... Uh, core group and um and i've been kind of like working on it ever since and, and managed to make a living from it up to this point which i think is quite remarkable in itself for an open source project which kind of like hasn't Indeed. always worked so well so yeah so so uh so and, and now i do a lot of stuff in uh, st uh um a fair amount of development in open sim at the moment and then a couple of other things like um you know steady setting up uh uh, a kind of foundation for various reasons and uh, and doing uh you know doing various blog posts and you know the usual kind of stuff mm. well i i think very few people would um argue with the fact that um open sim really has been the underlying architecture um for most of what we consider the metaverse expansion of late. I mean, uh, we've had people here from totally different platforms like Fastpark or whatever, but 
Um, wherever we go these days, wherever there is an alternative to obviously Second Life, which is where we're filming and it's, you know, the big public metaverse um, that, that everybody knows, mm. um, it really comes down to kind of um, open simulator base. Um, now, there's a lot of variation um, going on here. Um, you get... Um, Worlds like In Worlds and uh, Spot on 3D, which are very much closed garden affairs, a bit like Second Life itself. And mm -hmm. yet we, we have um, a vast number of other worlds, which um, like Reaction Grid, where I've got a place, for example, which are actually uh, hypergrid linked in the sense that um, the, the grid, uh, the open sim grid, underneath reaction grid can actually communicate and people can jump from that grid into another hypergrid um, installation of open sim. So I'm, I'm very curious. Um, you mentioned, um, I think the best place to start here is you did actually mention uh, just now that you've set up this trust recently, Overti, haven't you, which um, I gather is going to decrease the uh, time lag between code sharing with Linda Labs and other things. Would you like to elaborate? Yes. So the chief primary reason for setting up Overt at this time is because we have this historical issue. So, so over the years, we've had different developers in OpenSim, and IBM had a heavy involvement early on. And this is kind of like slightly surmise on my part, because funny enough, this history kind of gets a bit lost after a while. It's kind of a funny kind of thing. But mm. they're kind of like, as you would expect, very conservative about source code issues and the origin of various kind of kinds of source code. And there was a, a concern at the beginning that there could be arguments of things like derived copyright from the Linden Lab code base. If somebody came and, and looked at the Linden Lab code and then contributed something to OpenSIM, which is very, very much in the area of protocol, and not, not, not protocol itself, but code which was extremely similar or, or a, a sophisticated lawyer could argue was derived copyright. And mm -hmm. so subject to, you know, basically ownership by Linden Lab, um, that this could cause issues. Now, that code would still be under the GPL, uh, and OpenSIM is under the BSD, so that would be one thing, for instance. Um, and another thing would be that even even with that, one could... It's all very esoteric. A lot of open source stuff has not been tested in court, and it depends sometimes on just how conservative you want to be. Um, mm -hmm. But you could make an argument that this was Linden Lab-owned code, and there was a derivative copyright case to be made, and, you know, you could ultimately have someone like damages, and, you know, that's the extreme end of the spectrum. And, you know, so that kind of thing. So, so there's been this kind of, like, six-month rule um, whereby somebody can't effectively look at the viewer source code and work on OpenSIM at the same time. But overt is the first step to... is the step towards actively removing this barrier by having effectively a contributor's agreement, an actual organization which the code is licensed to rather than, you know, just being distributed by, by the developers themselves. So that there is kind of like a, there is kind of facility there to make sure or, or to reduce the risk of these kind of problems being associated with the code base. And this is quite a conservative thing. You know, you could make the argument that, hey, you know, it's just, this is silly. Just take down the barrier. It's all open source. And, you know, I, I, I certainly recognize that. But at the same time, you can also make arguments that, hey, you know, OpenSim is, um, is implementing a server which, um, where the viewer is primarily developed by a company which makes money off all this stuff. And once you start to get money involved, well, you know, all kinds of things can happen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you could argue that you are better off being more careful to try and make sure that these things are around for the long term, no matter where the metaverse goes in the future. So this is really the so, primary motivation. And so Overt really will uh, act as a repository and coordinates all the, all the code coming into the project, really? It will be. Well, the governance of OpenSIM itself will remain as it is now, which is effectively kind of like this anarchic group of, of developers who contribute a lot to the code base and so, you know, effectively become members of this group. Overt is more kind of a covering organization um, more than anything else at this stage. Now, it might, that might grow into something else in the future but I, I i want to be very much kind of flowing with the community on this kind of thing and go where where where, where things are heading right i don't think we're at the stage where nobody wants to set in the well it's a difficult thing to say i, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future so one might go to a point where there's kind of a more activist stance although i don't know how how you see, these are things I'm, I'm kind of like thinking at the moment. I don't know, I don't know how active that's going to be or where things are going to go in the future, but I think there is room for an organization which can kind of help promote the metaverse as well. 
And whether that's overt or, or something else, I think, I think to kind of slowly grow it in that manner would be very interesting. So, so it's going, you know, I don't know where things are going to go in the future, but there are possibilities. Yeah. Great. I, I must say, I've, I've always been a, a little bit puzzled about um, the open source at, aspect of OpenSIM because we all know that it, I mean, even, I believe that even Second Life was derived from the, uh, it, was it the Hippo code originally anyway, even before it became uh, Second Life? So there's a vague, co- there's a no, common no, base. No, no it, it definitely flows the other way. Second, uh, Linda right. Lab wrote all their code and, and then open sourced it. Right, because as you say, they are a commercial company, and um, they uh, recently, of course, um, well, I say recently, but within the last year, say, we've had the Viewer 2, um, we've had, had all sorts of new things accumulating recently in the Viewer 3 and Mesh and everything else, and it seems to me that although they clearly at some point open-sourced um, a, a certain amount of code on which Open Simulator is, uh, Simulator, sorry, is based, um, well, they do, there I have they... to be very careful as well, Mal, you see. Um, mm. Open Simulator isn't based upon any code from Linden Lab, really. Um, I mean, it's all been independently developed, and this is why we're being so careful about the licensing. If we were based on any Linden Lab code, then, you know, we, there wouldn't be any point in any of this. It would be, you know, right. we'd have, the situation would be different. But Open Sim has been built separately from the ground up. So we're not really, you know, we're not connected with that with Linden Lab in that way. But of mm. course, there's a very close relationship naturally because you know Second Life is the game in town, such, such as, 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 as it is at the moment, and the Second Life viewer is the one which, uh, you know, the viewers are the one which everybody uses, as you say. There are these other metaverses, but the culture yeah. is here. Exactly, I describe um, you know Second Life as the as the showroom, the creative sort of um, a hub. As it were, you know, um, uh, people, um, you know, people have companies and they're behind the firewall, even on OpenSIM, whereas they come here to put their showroom. They don't necessarily have the factory here. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, um, well, one of the other issues is uh, actually um, uh, really, uh, I suppose it actually annoys me in a way, is um, viewers um, for these platforms. Now, one of the things that... Um, when you're in an open sim platform, you instinctively feel um, the similarities to Second Life because, as you say, they share viewers to a great extent. Um, most open sims still have um, – you have an interface, as it were, which resembles the old Second Life one rather than the new one, but that's changing too. But I, I find it increasingly annoying. Uh, very little irritating things. Um, for example, when you copy a slurl to the clipboard, in an open sim, it gets carried across as a second life location, which, of course, when somebody clicks on this, is totally dysfunctional. And I've got to say, one of the things I'm really hoping to see is um, a viewer that sort of, even if it has stuff missing, actually gets to basics and actually sort of has in it those things that are common to all platforms. And obviously, um, slurls go to slurl.com or whatever, so there would have to be um, a hypergrid type system for um, location linking. I, I know uh, yes. um, Maria at Hypergrid Business has Hyperica, which she's hoping will become a directory and things. But um, it does seem to me that um, it, whenever we're in OpenSim, as it were, in one of the viewers, I would t- it would tend to be Hippo or Imprudence in my case, I think. Um, you know, you, you've got the Second Life legacy hanging around and, you know, the, the buttons there that just don't need to be there and there aren't, the, um, you know, the, the destination business is probably a case in point. There's um, a lot of things that it seems could usefully be plugged into it to make it work wholly independent of Second Life. Um, you know, a viewer that could maybe go to Second Life as well but could, you know, be used to launch some kind of alternative to slurls. Now, I don't know uh, um, whether that's in your frame of reference, whether it's something you would see OpenSimulator.org um, developing or whether you would just hope somebody else comes up with that. Well, I yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There's definitely, there's definitely an issue of navigating around these things at the moment. I mean, the hypergrid is a case in point in that you have these very kind of strange issues. We'll leave light aside the, you know, the protocol changes of hypergrid itself, but you have these issues mm-hmm. where for instance, because of the because of the metaphor used by the viewer, such that everything is on this two D map, 
um, you can't you can't you, to teleport to another region you can't be occupying the same square I believe and it can't be something like more than 4096 regions away in any oh order. yeah so yeah and that, that kind of thing along with the OSL I mean it's kind of very early days I my personal so one of my, my, my what I'd really what I really want to work towards and what, I, what I'd really like is an open source kind of ecosystem for virtual environments which is like that of the web because the web is enormously successful in the sense of having all these open source components and people being able to develop things separately, but actually be all tied together by common standards. And that's another topic entirely. But that has been enormously successful. And, and, you know, the vast majority of the web infrastructure is built on open source stuff. And if we can start heading in that direction with virtual environments, then we can unleash a huge amount of innovation um, to actually drive things forward. So we're taking steps to try and start to remove some of the barriers. The, the overt is one to actually remove the six month barrier between server and client. Um, because I think that causes, I mean, that naturally causes many issues because, you know, if, if one can't develop on both, then you have to rely on coordination between people. And sometimes at these early stages, that simply isn't possible. Sometimes you need one person with a vision. So by reducing those kind of barriers and and, and again, another issue is business models. I, I firmly, some, I'm a big open source person. I, I love open source, you know, probably from my history. But at the same time, I, I think there needs to be business models behind these kinds of things. People need to be able to make money to actually sustain a metaverse and have people interested and invested in it. So to me, another big, where do we go is how do we get these business models for people to, you know, run an OSL website or, or whatever or run um, kind of virtual marketplaces or, or, or all that kind of thing. So, so it's like, well, how, you know, what are the next steps to go in that direction? Because I think there's an enormous, there's an, I don't let me go on too long, but there's an enormous no, kind of possibilities in this whole technology, this whole idea of presence and people actually being somewhere and being immersed and a huge number of things from that, but starting to talk to people who, you know, I would never talk, um, get to meet or talk to in real life, you know, academic professors or, or people in education or, you know, or, or all kinds of people. And, and actually bringing people together and actually having a kind of sense of presence in cyberspace, in cyberspace, which yeah. is another word. Um, well, yeah, presence is really the opposite world. Um, yes. I, I, I think. And um, no, I quite agree, I quite agree with you. You know, we're, we meet people from all walks of life, and I guess our use of the platform is a commonality because um, you're right. We, you know, we cross over from, uh, so, you know, media, programming, artists. Um, you know, everything is sort of intermingling to a certain Yes, there's a, there's, there's a huge mm -hmm. number of people who just come together. And of course, second line, Linda Lab, this grid is great for that because you do have a huge, well, rel <laughs> you have a relatively huge population, um, certainly compared to any of the um, kind of alternative grids. And the hypergrid, this is why the hypergrid is enormously interesting to me. And, and Chris does, you know, who invented it, is a real visionary in this area. Um, but yeah. this idea that instead of having a centralized set of asset services and inventory services, as you have, you know, something like Linden Lab at the moment, you instead have this whole set of stuff distributed around the Internet. Um, so anybody can come along and set up their own simulator or set of simulators. And people can navigate there via URLs effectively. And, of course, it's much more complicated than the web because you're bringing along your appearance and your inventory and all that kind of funky stuff. And, you know, where do the assets go when you res things? And, you know, can you even res yeah. things? And all of these kinds of really interesting and complicated questions. Um, but by allowing anybody to come along and rock up and start up their own simulator, whether that's OpenSim or something else, um, and actually get on this network, then you start to have network effects where every single person um, adds a little bit more value to the network and they, in turn, gain the already existing value of the networks. So you start to get this kind of like virtuous circle. So that's the kind of thing which is potentially really interesting with something like Hypergrid. And, you know, might, you might get to the um, place where you don't need everything in one single grid. You can, you know, people can go wherever. And so the whole population of the metaverse, if you like, is the whole set of connected installations, not one particular grid. Exactly. Well, something that it's uh, it's good that you're here this week in many ways because um, a fortnight ago we had uh, Bruce Joy from Fast Park, which isn't related to OpenSim. It's a totally different thing, but um, he has started um, an open source project uh, called Open Avatar, and um, it involves meshes and um, lots of descriptive files for you know um, everything from the shape of an avatar to its um, you know assets it carries around with it and whatever but and um, the week uh, the week before I had Maria from Hypergrid Business here and we were uh, uh, talking 
again about the um, well I guess what comes down to asset servers um, at the moment every time you go onto a grid the asset server is um, the grid you're on and when you move out of a grid say using hypergrid somewhere else the um, the uh, you're still connecting with the asset server that you logged in from unless you actually res something on another grid in which case it enters the asset server of that grid as a copy and um, I d I'm, I'm just wondering um, in terms of the future do you think we are going to actually see enterprises um, starting up um, actually whose sole function if you like is to run asset servers um, to look after our virtual goods so that we can transport them between grids and maybe even transport them between things like Open Simulator and um, Linden Labs Grid. I'm not saying Linden's are going to jump to agree, but there might come a time where they have no choice but to open the gates and um, to the hypergrid or something. Yes, I think you're right. I think there is the possibility of completely independent businesses doing that kind of thing. Um, in some ways, it's not it's, it's, it's kind of like a, I mean, an asset service is not an enormously complicated service. You're really just shunting a bit of data back and forth. Um, and of course, but then you get into interesting issues like security and who owns what, what if somebody uploads, a, you know, a, a texture which is copyrighted to that grid, who's responsible? Are you just, you know, the, um, the ISP, if you like, are you just carrying it and you're not responsible for that? Or is there another kind of issue? So, yes, mm -hmm. I, I think you're right. You can get these services spring up. I think there's actually in the future, um, when we get more growth, there's actually an enormous opportunity for these third-party services. So another thing, for instance, is user profiles. So at the moment, user profiles mm. is in the same situation. It's all kind of like on one grid. Linden Lab has their own set of profiles, and maybe some of the other grids kind of like hook them up into their own back-end services. But if you're traveling from grid to grid, you do you really want that user profile to come with you. If I come here, I want all the same information to be accessible as if I'm on some other grid. Um, yeah. And the hypergrid, I think, does... I'm not sure that the hypergrid actually implements that at the moment. It, it conceivably could be done, but then you start to get all these profiles being maintained by single grids, and, and then it's like, well, doesn't it become much more efficient to have them maintained by a single place? And, mm. of course, nowadays with Vera Free, where, and I know not everybody likes web profiles, but what's very, very interesting about web profiles is it does decouple that from the viewer interface itself. So suddenly, maybe mm. you could point that web profile to some centralized place. So if I go from... I'm talking about centralization again, but if I go from yeah. this grid, for instance, say say this was a grid I could travel to, um, say New World Grid, for instance, from here, mm. then uh, then maybe when I when somebody clicks the profile or, or asks for my profile, then we then both times it goes to a single website and the same website where I've chosen to upload my profile and have them look after it. Okay, I trust them with my personal data or whatever, and I want to expose that to all these other places. So it's distributed identity again, which is very similar to some of the stuff going on on the web at the moment. It's kind of like an extension mm. of that, even more so because there's so much presence data and in personal data and something like, you know, there's a personal medium, there's a very engaging medium, this, this whole uh, virtual environments. So mm. I think there's actually a lot of possibility kind of, kind of third-party businesses to kind of spring up doing this kind of thing. Um, at the moment, it's, you know, super early days for all this kind of stuff. Uh, and there's all these kinds of issues. But in the future, you know, um, and this is one of the beauties of having this as, as an open source ecosystem. There's no single company in control. As long as mm. the standards are there, anybody can come up and try their hand at it um, and actually make a go of it. And, and so you can get innovation from completely independent sources, which is not all directed by one company, which is always kind of like a choke point on things. So mm. I think there are very interesting possibilities in that space. It, it actually it astonishes me, actually, how many different directions the, the Open Simulator base has gone in. Um, and sometimes it actually worries me. I mean, I, I look at, say, um, a grid like in Worlds, which is clearly um, the, probably, the, well, they are probably, if you forget the, the Franco grid and the nationally based ones, um, it's probably the closest to Second Life in the sense that it is, it's obviously started up to, after the Second Life model. Um, you know, it's the creative uh, community feeling, uh, whatever, um, that is attracting people there. Yet they um, don't have hypergrid switched on. Uh, there's another grid, uh, Spot on 3D, for example, that have a, a something like a double login process, um, have their own very particular things, and they 
obviously um, the code has been highly modified uh, for what they do. Where I have land um, in Reaction Grid, um, uh, as you probably know, this week has been very active for Reaction Grid because they've literally, um, uh, I think it's Microsoft.net or something they're using the back end, but they've, they haven't been able to bring in the most recent OpenSIM code until very recently, and they've been beta testing it. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of these grids um, <clears throat> have actually um, obviously taken uh, the open simulator code and then they've modified it to their own requirements now nothing wrong with that <laughs> you know it make it it gives an added attraction or a different aspect to each of the grids but it seems to me that um there's a danger that they're going to move further and further away from the core uh code um and especially when um you talk about grids that aren't hypergrid enabled um it's sort of um, well, uh, e excessive modification, shall I say, would seem to be setting some of the grids out on a limb, which I think is taking them away from the, the center of interoperability, is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, do, you, do, you feel, uh, do you feel that's happening? Because obviously you're, you see the repository of all the centrally held open source code, Mm -hmm. But obviously, some people are taking that off and doing extra things with it, which is fine in itself. But are, do you think too many people are doing too many extra things in too many different directions, is what I'm saying? Well, so my... Tough question, yeah. <laughs> it is a tough question. So, first of all, I think all these kind of alternative grids, whether they uh, contribute code back to OpenSim or whether they've gone in their own direction... Uh, using OpenSim as a base are still great, right? We're in the really early days of everything. And I think any innovation, any kind of pe person, people doing stuff in this space is is absolutely fantastic. You know, people are taking all kinds of risks and uh, and actually doing a lot of stuff. And you need to explore the space because there's a huge, I think there's a huge untapped potential in, in virtual world. And I'm sure, you know, you agree with me, Mal. Um, and it's just so un it's just so early that we don't even know what's not known yet, if you like. It's the old Donald Rumsfeld yeah. quote. You know, we don't know the unknown unknowns. Um, so I think anybody doing work in this space is great. Now, having said that, I, I personally would wish that more people would contribute back to the core of OpenSim. Um, I think partly because it does reduce their, their kind of like, um, it does kind of reduce their cost of maintaining some of this stuff. And, and admittedly, you know, there's not a huge differential in cost probably because, you know, probably the development rates are kind of like not hugely different. Um, and, I, and I don't see, I personally don't see the value in doing kind of basic fixes and then not redistributing them, um, you know, because to me, the, different, the difference in, in kind of like all these grids is their culture and the kind of like the specific stuff they offer, not the basic simulator itself. So, so you know, I would wish that, but I'm not in the business of forcing people to do that. That's just my wish, right? And if people don't want to do that, yeah. then, then that's up to them. I mean, as you say, there are other potential costs in that you do start to drift away from kind of this public code base, which a lot of people mm. use. Um, and so, you know, it can manifest itself in all kinds of subtle ways. One of the big things of OpenSim at the moment is that there are a huge number of de facto standards. So all the kind of objects here, so this is where, I'm, you know, Drag me, uh, drag me back if I get too techy, right? But all the object serializations, yeah. kind of very arbitrary stuff at the moment. They're kind of derived from internal open sim structures, so they're very redundant. They're they're not very good, um, but it is kind of a standard. It's what goes in the kind of raw files and the IR files, and means you can reload that stuff back into another open sim grid. So if you know somebody were to change that arbitrarily, then suddenly their stuff does become incompatible with, you know, you couldn't just take that stuff and load it back into another OpenSim grid if you got tired of one particular grid, for instance. Mm -hmm. You'd have to either go for some conversion process and, you know, that, I mean, I don't think anybody's really working with that at the moment, or you just have to accept that, hey, you can't, you can't take your content out again. And, you know, for some reason, for some people, that's fair enough. And so, you it's know, sorry, go on. No, I was just to say, it's actually been one of the, the selling factors, if you like, I think, for OpenSim has been the fact that uh, you can have your own private local installation or you can um, have space on, um, you know, a hosted server. Um, but, you know, it's the place where you can build. You can build, you know, um, behind closed doors or build in public if you want, but then you can save it, you can export it, and then you can even import a copy into Second Life or into InWorlds or whatever. Um, 
because at the moment those uh, the wall gardens actually forbid export so you know it's really plus point for open sim that you can build and then yeah. so long as it's yours you keep copies and you deploy them wherever you want so i know there are all kinds of tensions here obviously stuff like copyright and ip protection is a, is a huge thing right and people are, are concerned about that um i mean personally you know i will say that I don't think you can really protect this stuff. I think it's like the web. If you're going to be like the web, if you're going to be distributed, then you're going to have distributed content. That's that's just what's going to happen. Um, and that you know that's one view of the world, and that's kind of the view that I think OpenSim pursues in being open and not you know not being able to exert any control over this because of the very basis of its fundamental kind of design. Um, mm. And so you know you get alternatives like the people like, like the you know the closed grids, which do offer much or try you know i don't know i cannot comment on how successful it ultimately is but they try and offer a much higher standard of content protection and that's another way to go you know i think we need to do all these experiments i don't think you know i you can't just come down and say hey this is the solution this is it you've got to experiment um but yeah i mean being able to take content and move it from place to place is a big draw so my one of my chief interests is things like education and training in, in these environments because I think you know that to me is a hugely interesting opportunity um, and you know can really enhance um, kind of human well-being right to actually be mm, able to learn sure. things quicker or more effectively you know that's that's absolutely fantastic that's brilliant um, so you know to me spreading the technology as wide as possible is, is what I really really want to do and this is you know why I work in this kind of open source field and not you know I don't do proprietary stuff or you know very little um, so you know so open sim is is I would say just by its very nature of being an open source project and and not being controlled and not being a single grid is effectively kind of goes towards this thing of of being able to you know set stuff up and import and export and all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is enormously important. Mm. <coughs> Sorry, coughing here. Um, something I, I find um, that I'm beginning to realise just now. <coughs> Pardon me, I have a slight croak. Um, I have um, an avatar um, here in Second Life. I've got Malburn's writer, there's a Malburn's footman, uh, whatever. On other grids, um, there's usually just Malburn's if I can get it, but um, there's a Malburn's reactor, there's a Malburn's doobie, there's all sorts of Malburn's around. I did try and get, keep the commonality of the first bit where I can. Hmm. And um, I was sniffing around um, trying to log into a grid the other day and I couldn't for the life of me think what my name on that grid was and what my password for that grid was. And uh, I suddenly realized, you know, I hop into Reaction Grid. Um, I hop into Joycadia Grid, Franco Grid, a few others. And usually I go via Joycadia Grid um, and use SAS Avatar for hypergridding. But, you know, I, I, I suddenly find myself in a state of confusion because OpenSim, in a way, is so successful. I have so many avatars on so many different grids, and I've long since forgotten the names <laughs> and the passwords <laughs> to get in. And this seems to be another thing that maybe this separation of grids um, is actually um, doing against themselves, if you like, without realizing it. You know, can a grid keep my attention when um, it's not like Second Life or Action Grid and I'm logging in all the while? And, you know, um, I'm sure we have this with web websites. You know, you go to a website you haven't yes. used for a, a while and you've long since forgotten your username, let alone your password. Yes. And it drops off your radar. And I, I t tend to worry that a lot of um, OpenSIM installations go drop off the radar. Um, not for any criticism of the actual grid itself, but because of just these quirky little things, like the fact that somebody may not use it often enough to remember that name. And, um, you know, I always try Malbones first. And, you know, um, I... Same I've, password? I've, yeah, yeah. Yay. I mean, you know, it's said not a good idea, but it makes life well, easy. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. And you know, but I look at my friends list uh, when I log in um, on the hypergrid, and I'll see two or three instances of the same person because I befriended them, and somehow they stick in your list, even though you yeah. befriended them on a grid, a grid you were visiting and things. So uh, I mean. You know, uh, I guess we're back to the kind of coding that's done. But, uh, you know, I, I just see a lot of these little things rather than any big thing as kind of obstacles in the, the kind of take up of this. Um, do, is yeah. there anything that could be easily done, do you think, to 
remedy that or is it I, I I know I don't think so I think as you say it's a lot of these little things and it's going to be time and people I mean I mean frankly people putting in the development effort and being you know being you know wanting to to kind of like come along and help you know birth this kind of metaverse because this stuff is enormously complicated right this is this is orders of complexity more than a web server i mean opism has a web server embedded within it <laughs> and there are a whole load of stuff on top so there's a huge number of these things um and i think it's just going to be time and if we get the opportunity if, if things go our way if if we if we're able to maintain um development on this stuff and actually inspire people and have them come in and, and be willing to push and extend and in the future and do that kind of stuff but at the same time be able to maintain um, a level of compatibility so you know there's, there's this tension as well between features again the old tension between features and bug fixes and things like you know pushing forward and being compatible still so right. it really comes down i mean there's a there's a huge amount of potential work right I and mean, there's a huge number of things you could do so it really does come down to i think time and people just slowly fixing these things and the and the whole thing developing so i'm afraid no easy fix i think is what i'm saying now <laughs> okay well um i think a couple of questions are coming in but before we go over to those um the, the this um something i was keen on here uh the future the future of open sim um now um the big news with second life of course has been the arrival of mesh but um as i understand it mesh has been available um without any special linden viewer 2 code in uh, open sim for a while now and uh, Media on a Prim, for example, um, is available in uh, some open sim installations. And um, is there anything new uh, on the horizon? Uh, new capabilities that are coming out of the open source code? Maybe even stuff that um, Linden Labs can't emulate? So, so being careful here for a moment, Mesh has been a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a thing for a while because there was this implementation of Mesh, Mesh in the beta viewers. Um, which OpenSim did very early. And it was somewhat different in mechanism from the mesh we have now. So you get this situation where the older mesh, you know, the old OpenSims can't handle the new mesh thing. The current development version of OpenSim and the coming, the coming 072 does handle um, mesh. Of course, there are going to be all kinds of bugs because it's an experimental feature. Um, but, it, you know, you can upload your mesh objects um, as you can here now. Um, so that's there. And, yeah, things like Media on a Prim are there. I think the things that... OpenSim tends to do better are the things which are kind of like server-side things like ORs and IARs, which, you know, don't have any equivalent in Second Life because of the whole fact that, you know, you don't want people to <laughs> export things en masse, so you don't tend to have that. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that OpenSim has. And, of course, you can get into more stuff in the future. Um, it's kind of like, and I think actually removing the barriers between things like server and viewer make that easier because people can then work on both sides and do some kind of experimentation and do this little hacking thing and, and kind of get stuff working better mm. and more easily. So I think we're going to see that. And of course, things like NPCs, as you kind of, I, I think, mentioned maybe in the pre-show, David Burden of... Um, of uh, Oh, yes, man, that, that, that awful. Uh, Dayden, Dayden of Dayden. Yes, yeah. So uh, that's that was my next question. Actually, that uh, that non-player characters uh, is the NPC, and um, uh, David Burton actually paid you, didn't he? I believe commissioned you to actually de deliver the yes. code for this, and yes. then gave it back to the open source community. So maybe yes, tell me which was that. which was great of him because you know then it means that anybody can start experimenting and building upon this functionality. Um, so, you know, it's not anything grand at the moment. There was a long time ago uh, various NPC functions within OpenSim. And for a while, you know, they've been built and they've been broken basically because, you know, there weren't regression tests in that area. And, and you know, they, they kind of fall into disuse. But David saw the potential and so allowed me to do some, some work on those. And, you know, it's very, again, I'm afraid I have to caveat, it's experimental stuff. It kind of like, you know, I... The thing of these, these environments are really complicated. So there's all kinds of edge cases um, and kind of issues with this stuff. So you don't know exactly what kind of bugs people are going to find. But, you know, that's another thing we do have, which uh, is interesting, which you can have an NPC and kind of move it about and, and kind of have attachments on it and have it kind of do stuff. And, you know, there are, there are probably some features missing. I think one of them is um, uh, really there should be, uh, it should work like the other targeting system and actually be able to say, say to the avatar, go to this place and tell me when you're done, you, which you can emulate by having kind of attachments on an avatar and, and have them kind of like know when they've reached mm. the target. And there's little things like the fact that avatars don't stop dead on where you tell them to go, which is a bit of a pain. 
And it basically comes down to a very complex interaction with the physics engine, um, which is, you know, not an easy thing to fix, unfortunately. So, you know, there's these issues, but you can have, you know, these avatars. So, you know, that's another interesting thing. And there's room to do that on the server side, which, you know, you can't necessarily do in the now because, you know, they don't have to, you know, they're talking about NPCs yeah. as well, I think, now. So that's going to be interesting. But, you know, you can do these things quickly. And, well, you can do these things on the server side. So, we, you know, we do have things like that. Um, yeah, so they're, they're always interesting things. I mean, Dayton have uh, uh, had a long time innovation, really, on the things they've been doing in Second Life and on OpenSim. I mean, you know, I think there's a demand here in in business use of the metaverse, um, you know, to have receptionists that are scripted, you know, rather than manned all day long, for example, by an avatar. Obviously, you they, people need manned avatars to answer specific questions. But, you know, if you can develop scripts and AI type of logarithms to get avatars that will actually do the routine work for you a bit like robotics um you know there's um a, you know there's clearly a lot of um yeah, space yeah i think there are interesting things you could do and, and to me it's all about basic functionality if we can get some basic functionality in, and then we let everybody else build on top of it with scripts or experiments or mm -hmm. whatever and then then that's what you get you know it's not it's not specific stuff it's just basic features um, to enable that, and because you can have all these things of hooking into external web servers and all the rest of it, you know, I think I think there are uh, very interesting kind of experiments you can do. Mm. The arrival of Mesh, uh, still on Mesh here, uh, briefly, um, in Second Life um, is something that is actually uh, many people perceive it, and I think I'd agree as quite a sort of culture shift. Um, as far as the Second Life platform is concerned, because for the first time, um, I mean, excluding importing static images and things like that, um, for the first time, um, people are going to be able to author um, things in external software, uh, possibly uh, to a better extent than Linden Labs' own software can, can offer and then import into Second Life. Uh, Bruce Joy mentioned the when we're talking about the open avatar thing, he, here implied that there would be a kind of mesh avatar that you could carry around the web and any virtual world you want. And potentially, although you couldn't enter Second Life with that avatar, you could import the mesh of that avatar so you've got a duplicate of your portable avatar in Second Life. And arguably, you could do this on OpenSim too, where you, you presumably can't just walk in with an external avatar, but at least you could import a mesh copy of the avatar. Um, do you see, if, uh, um, uh, particularly from the avatar point of view, do you see any future in that, uh, particularly with regard to OpenSim? Well, I think it's, it's, I mean, I don't actually get involved in the content side of things very much. Um, mm. You know, I'm, I'm strictly a developer. I'm, I'm absolutely rubbish at creating content. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't tickle my brain somehow. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think, yep. yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I think certainly you can import this stuff. I mean, we are reliant on, you know, what's implemented in the view at the moment. So if Second Life can do it, certainly, you know, there's a possibility of OpenSim doing it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. yeah I, it's not my area in some, in some ways, but I think there's, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Okay. Well, we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so left, so the first thing I'm going to do now, I think, is um, invite Dusa Dragonash, my colleague at NBC here, to come on. Um, she apparently has a couple of questions, um, either from the TV audience or the audience here. So, are you there, Dusa? Yes, I am. Hi. Carry on. Okay. Well, actually, it's sort of two or three questions in one from FD, who's watching on the net. Uh, he says, uh, so there is already some amount of users, but open sim or virtual worlds usually aren't something most people would have ever heard of. Do you have any opinion? Is there already a killer app, for example, for virtual worlds? Or is there some technical obstacle before that, for example, standard protocols, as you mentioned before? Well, I'm going to say Minecraft. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, I find Minecraft an enormously interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, because Minecraft has far outclipsed, I mean, Second Life, let alone OpenSim. Um, in terms of, I mean, maybe in, maybe it's for a certain type of audience, admittedly. Maybe it's for that kind of geek um, kind of audience. But, you know, that has been, an, I mean, you know, it's a really fun game. It's enormously successful. And, and, and of, of course, it is more, you know, it's more game-like, right? I mean, it has those elements of game, but it also has these elements of building 
and so and you know social and all kinds of stuff which second life does as well but and yet it has been enormously more successful and to me the interesting question is why why is it much more successful and i think there are a lot of a lot of different que- uh, different uh, issues you can point to for starters the the user interface is far simpler than something like a second life viewer right i mean it's still you know it's probably not obvious but it's something you can just pick up and start using and yeah there's a bit of fiddling um but stuff like the crafting i find the crafting stuff absolute genius the way that you just plonk stuff down and pick it up again and there suddenly you've got a shovel or something and that that you know <laughs> that's amazing that's really easy to do unlike something like a second life fear which is enormously calm i mean you know some people disagree with me some people are probably you know think it's okay but to me a second life fear is an enormously complicated piece of software to operate it's not easy at all and i think that is one thing um uh, but I think Minecraft can also show us interesting things that maybe don't matter. I mean, some people do cite graphics and that kind of thing as being a being a blocker. And I think I don't think that's untrue. But then something like Minecraft is not exactly the most graphically sophisticated. I mean, I'm not dissing it or anything. I think you know it's it's fine for, you know, it's a fine application. But it's not you know it's not photorealistic. Put it that way. I mean, it's a specific kind of thing. And yet, and yet it is still enormously successful. That has not blocked its success. And maybe it even helps by having this very Lego-like universe and and fitting that into a certain mindset and way of thinking so you know i think the, i think that shows that the area does have an almost potential and, and the question is yes why why aren't we there is it a particular factor of the complexity because second life again is an order of complexity higher the fact that you can you know you can import your own textures and all that kinds of stuff and that makes it hugely more complicated it makes the interface more complicated it makes the server back end more complicated it, you know and that makes it much more difficult just to get up and running and, and that's why you know we're still open sim four and a half years later there is a huge i mean i will make no bones about it there's a huge number of bugs and things that don't work um and it is kind of a thing that, yeah it happens to work for some things <laughs> that's great but you know it's such an enormously complicated problem to do and something like minecraft is you know, it's a great, great system, but, you know, it doesn't face some of the same problems of uploading data and having arbitrary um, kind of meshes and textures there. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, that to me is is kind of like where one can look at, look at and see if one can learn some lessons from that. Um, but the actual reasons for why we're not so much more popular is, yeah, I, I don't, the answer is I don't know. I think there's a whole host of reasons. And I think some of it's cultural. The, the culture hasn't built up yet to the point where, People are gonna kind of come in and do this thing every day, and I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't know exactly where we go, and that's why, that's why it's one of the most interesting things. But to me, having something open source at least gives you a chance, a shot at doing something interesting. You're not dependent on one single company, which may one day fold or you know stop innovating and just you know decide to sit in its laws. And at least you've got the possibility of doing something great. That's funny. I, I have yet to actually explore Minecraft. Or so, I mean, I've heard the buzz and I've watched some videos. In fact, I even saw that some of these sort of, it, it was like ray traced water actually brought into Minecraft. So, um, uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, Philip, Philip Rosedale in Creating Second Life Boundary was inspired by Lego. And now I look at Minecraft and I thought, Lego, so there's got to be a commonality there somewhere. <laughs> Um, but I, I guess it's resolution, isn't it? You know, you can have a tiny little Lego piece, and it, uh, if you close up, you can see it. But if you expand it enough, then the resolution becomes so dense that you don't notice it's made of these things mm. anymore. Mm. Um, any more questions, uh, do, sir? Uh, Dave, you're muted. Ah. Um, I don't hear do this, so presumably we have... Not for uh, now, not for now. Not for now. Okay, well, we're nearing yes. the end. So. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dizzo. Thank you. Right. Um, okay, uh, what's we got? We've got, uh, we got about five minutes left or something. Um, I think I've covered all the things that I, I, I hastily jotted down here in terms of notes. Uh, what I like to kind of do um, at the, uh, the end of these uh, shows is get a, a kind of personal perspective from the guest on um, where things are going and like a, a bit of a wish list. You know, it, um, A, is there anything, um, you know, that you can't wait for that you see on the horizon? And, and also generally... Um, uh, what you see on the horizon, particularly with the, the growth of the metaverse and the, the future of the metaverse, and of course, in your case, the consumer later. Hmm, hmm. It's called put well, you on the spot time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I will make it up as I go along, as usual. Um, no, I th- the chief thing I would really want is very basic, and that that is more kind of like 
people kind of like coming along to OpenSim and, and growing the community and developing and kind of contributing code and, and content, I think. I think there's very interesting things you can do. Um, because, you know, when with an open source project like this, where Open Simulator isn't backed by a single company, it's not one of these things where you have a, a lot of employees kind of like, um, you know, pay to work in it every day. It's really dependent upon the community and the people who come and contribute. And they make an enormous difference and, you know, can have an enormous influence on the project. So that, that to me, you know, if we're going to go anywhere, it's by the efforts of these people, of, of these good people. So, so this is my chief, chief wish. Um, and, you know, are there things that we could do better? Yeah, very, very probably. And I'd be, I'm always interested to hear them. Um, you know, you get all kinds of aspects to open source projects because they're chaotic and anarchic and, you know, people do what they like to some extent. You know, you don't have the same kind of uh, thing that you'd have from a, from a company. So you are dependent upon... Uh, of people getting involved and that kind of thing so anybody who's out there and, and is thinking of you know they'd like to contribute please do please do come along um so where are we going well that's a you know it's a, a really complicated question um i i think we're gonna see you know steady steady growth for you know uh, for the now i think we're gonna we're slowly pulling down some of those barriers which kind of get people a lot of people interested so so I'll give you an example, for instance, Mesh. Um, I mean, I've talked to people over the years who, you know, people in, um, for instance, in museums, in, in kind of like um, interest in digital museums and being able to kind of like put content in virtual environments and have people look around it and actually have this stuff archived, be able to pull out, a, uh, I'm, just, I'm not a great history buff, be able to pull out a, uh, an Arc de Triomphe or something in the future and, <laughs> and kind of have people admire it and have these things kind of digitally preserved. And so one of their big issues was the fact that Second Life didn't do mesh, or the Second Life system didn't do mesh. You know, they were they were looking at Unity, they were looking at stuff like Vast Park, you know, and one, Open Wonderland, all these you know great alternative projects, and they do mesh. And you know, the Open Sim Second Life ecosystem has not done mesh, and so you know they they don't tend to get involved. But now suddenly, if you have mesh, there's a whole another constituency of people who are going to get interested because suddenly the the facility they really need is there. So it's things like mesh, it's things like voice. The voice story on Open Sim is not very good at the moment. Um, you know, there are difficulties there. Some people kind of have some basic stuff working, but quality isn't very good. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like slowly bumped along. But that, again, is another big thing. I'm a big... I know some people don't like voice, but to me, voice is critical. Um, it really oh, draws me in to the, to the whole system. If I sit here... I mean, my avatar is not great because I don't come into Second Life very often, so it tends to be whatever bizarre random thing I had last time. So this is nothing like me in real life. Um, no, it's possible. I, I'm not sporting, it's the wrong, I'm, I'm, yeah, anyway, I won't go into that. Um, and I, I never wear a suit or tie. I've no idea why I'm wearing a suit and tie. Um, oh that is, actually, I really should change <clears throat> that. It's pretty bad. Mm. Um, but anyway, um, oh, man. Um, so, yeah, so mesh is another thing. Voice is another thing. You know, people really want voice. I mean, so, not, I shouldn't say people in general. Certain constituencies really want voice, and it's a big thing. So if we get voice, then I think we're going in that direction. Um if we get better voice, then yeah, there's another block of people who are going to get interested. So it's all these little, it's piling on these little things, these little features, um, which kind of mm. like form enough of a, a kind of critical mass to start self-sustaining kind of like development, like, you know, like Apache, like on the, on the web. I mean, that was a bit different. So, you know, Tim Berners-Lee came along with these kind of like protocols and then Apache was done by one kind of person in CSA, but then a load of people mm. start to contribute patches. So there's different, different kind of like, um, different paths um, towards the goal, but if you can get enough constituencies, constituencies involved and enough universities who can actually have, you know, students or professors who can actually have the time to, you know, aren't burdened by commercial pressures, right, who actually have the time to experiment and contribute code, um, then, you know, I think there are very interesting places you can go. So that, to me, to this the future, slowly adding these extra facilities and gaining enough of a critical mass to, to really, you know, start accelerating and going forward and doing all these other kinds of interesting things. <coughs> <clears throat> do you think um, that, uh, we, we've seen what uh, Tipedian are doing and things like that where you can actually put an open inst sim installation up in, in a window on the web? Do you think that would make a big difference? Um, yeah, I think, I think you know, people do bring up this, um, this issue of the, um, the kind of like the web interface very often. And, uh, and I think that would be very interesting. Um, it's a very complicated thing to do with a user-generated world. Um, because, you know, most of these systems are designed for static content or content, you know, that's going to be in there. They're not designed for people are, are uploading some arbitrary thing. Um, so I think it gets complicated. I think there's very interesting possibilities in the future of WebGL, for instance, 
um, actually not having to rely on a plugin um, and just yeah. be able to have the stuff in there. At the moment, you know, it's really not set up for this kind of thing. And I'd, I'd be hugely interested in stuff if somebody experimented with that. Um, but you kind of have these issues with the um, uh, the UDP protocol kind of like not working very well. I think there's very interesting things, even with, with yeah. Java. I'm going to get very geek, geeky. You can kind of um, <laughs> node.js and kind of like this stuff where the web itself is becoming more real time. So I think you can get very interesting yeah. there. So I, I think we're going to see progress, but <clears> I think it's, it is a difficult problem to crack. I'd love to see it done. Um, but I don't think it. I don't personally think it's going to be enormous soon. But I'd, I'd love to be wrong. Okay. Well, I think we'll cut the wrap there. I've got the people in the background here. So three <laughs> minutes left. Two minutes left. The way they usually do. So I, I uh, thank you for coming. I mean, it's been really enlightening. I mean, I think you've sort of, uh, put in layman's language fairly well. You know what the whole thing well, is about. Yes, and, it tends to be very dense. But uh, thanks a lot for inviting me and on Crossworld and letting me rabbit on a bit. Um, Right. Well, later in the series, I'm hoping to have some more sort of discussions where we'll have multiple people on at once. So maybe we'll um, be able to... Yeah, no, that'd that would be really cool. Sometime. I, yeah. But this is the really... You know, this, the, the example of your program here itself is, is really great. You know, you, podcasts are really great. I listen to a huge number of podcasts, you know, the Twit Network and all that kind of thing. Um, but here is, you know, you've got this added interesting dimension of, of kind of having this representation and kind of being in this space and the kind of an interesting other things you can do so so yeah i mean uh panel discussions and, and you know being able to just kind of meet people who you would never otherwise meet it's all about the engagement and the serendipity and that kind of stuff so so yeah no that'd be really yeah. great mel we love it we love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay um well um thanks for watching everybody um i would like to say we'll be back um in two weeks time we're a fortnightly show and um in two weeks i'll be joined by a tish shoot of yugo trade and we'll actually be looking at things a little bit beyond the metaverse augmented reality and maybe mobile metaverse um so uh do join me then in the meantime i'd like to thank again justin clark casey uh for joining us today and um we'll see you in two weeks bye for now Bye.